Ezekiel that open as ever, uh, so you can uh, see hopefully what I'm saying is coming from God's words together. Let's pray and ask for God's help as we, as we do so. Our Father God, we pray for your Spirit's work in us now as we come to this challenging topic. Please, would you speak to us by your words, be at work in us by your Spirit, that we would live as faithful followers of Jesus. In his name we pray. Amen. This is the sermon series I didn't want to preach. Uh, I've not wanted to really um, tackle this topic, I think partly because of the natural awkwardness that many of us have about talking about money. I've very much been keen to avoid any hint of manipulation. We've talked about money as a church in terms of our building project and giving towards that. And I've been very wary about wanting to be seen to, to either do or to be seen as manipulating people. Uh, I've been nervous particularly for guests. You know, maybe there's probably people in here who come to church for the first time today. And I'm very wary that the first sermon that you're going to hear <laughs> is about generous giving. We don't want to be seen, as, I don't want to, and we don't want to be seen as money grabbing. We are desperate to show anyone who comes that Lionstown Church isn't about what we can get from you, it is about what we can give you, that we can teach you of the wonderful gospel of the Lord Jesus, how you can have forgiveness of sins, a relationship with God, life now and for all eternity. It's about what we can give. So I've been very wary just even this week. When, as of Wednesday, I was talking to a member on our team and I was, he was saying, how are you doing? And I was, I'm actually was struggling in the preparation of this. My heart is not in it. And to be honest, I felt like that really until about Friday lunchtime. When I finally stopped really worrying about you lot and I preached a passage to myself. I should have done that earlier. But it took to about Friday afternoon to actually do that. And having finally done that, I can genuinely say I am excited to be preaching through this topic. Because I think ultimately my, my fear and hesitancy, my hesitancy was a fear that you would see me like one of those people outside the tube station with their fleece and their clipboards. Or the person who comes and knocks on your door and your heart sinks. Those people you try and dodge and avoid. But again, preaching this has reminded me that actually generous giving is all about grace. And I love preaching about grace. The undeserved gift of salvation that God gives and what flows from that. So over these three weeks, we are going to be thinking about generous Christian giving. And the majority of my applications are really going to be about general giving to the gospel work of our church. So this isn't three-week build-up to another gift day for our building project. Now, of course, there are going to be applications and implications for giving towards the building project, but that is not the purpose of this series. Uh, we as a church haven't looked at this topic for five, over five years and so this was really to teach us and help us think through and pray through our general giving to the gospel work of the church. Now it's also important to flag up that although that is what we're thinking about mainly in our applications, Paul's focus on this passage wasn't about our regular, someone's regular giving to church. In 2 Corinthians 8 and 9, the topic is about a one-off gift from one church or a group of churches to another church or another group of churches. But the principles that we're going to see from that one particular scenario are going to help us uh, as we think about our own generous Christian giving. Uh, and we'll see that particularly because we're going to see that generous giving is more about the heart than it is about the money. More about the heart than the money. So what was going on? Uh, this letter, we are jumping kind of halfway through the book of 2 Corinthians. Um, I'm not going to go too much into the book there, but what happened, there's quite a bit of background before we get to where we're coming in at chapter 8. Previously, Paul, the Apostle Paul, had told the church in Corinth 
about the dire situation of the churches in Jerusalem. For a number of reasons, they were suffering and struggling financially. And the Corinthian church, having heard about this from Paul, well, they committed to make a gift towards those struggling Christians. Indeed, they were so eager that Paul used their enthusiasm to encourage other churches to do the same. And it was a wonderful display, not only of practical care and brotherly, sisterly care for other Christians, but actually of, of, um, of gospel concern. Because Corinthians and the others, these were Gentile churches, i.e. non-Jew churches. And they were giving such of their concern for Jewish Christians, crossing that racial divide. But the problem was, a little while later now, by the time of this letter in 2 Corinthians, their good intentions hadn't come to fruition. And so Paul encourages them to, to get on and do it. He says it a number of times, perhaps the most clearest is verse 11. So now finish doing it as well, so that your readiness in desiring may be, may be matched by your completing it out of what you have. You see, their earlier enthusiasm had turned to reluctance. And so Paul is saying, come on, follow through with your intentions. He encourages them. But the interesting thing, and this is really going to be our focus today, is how he, uh, how he encourages them to, to get on and do it. You see, as an apostle Paul, he could just have simply told them to do it. You said you were going to, Give. You said you were, do it. But you can see from the beginning of verse 8, he says, I say this not as a command. The Apostle Paul doesn't say, just do it, get on with it. Because he knows that giving isn't just about the money, it's about the heart. And he wants to see their hearts changed. And when their hearts are changed, well then of course the generous giving is going to come as well. And so the first thing he does is to show them the example of the Macedonians. Here's the first point on your sheet there. The example of the Macedonians. Now, comparisons are sometimes really unhelpful, particularly when it's motivated by pride. Right? If you're trying to compare yourself just to make yourself feel good, that's not a healthy thing. But at the same time, good role models help us see what good things look like in practice. And it can also be a helpful gauge for how we're doing. And so Paul, to the Corinthian church, says, look at the example of the Macedonians. Now, the Macedonians, uh, that was a Roman province, uh, northern Greece. So if you know um, Acts and some of the letters in the New Testament, Philippi, Thess Thessalonica, Berea, the, those kind of churches up there. And their example is remarkable. Have a look down at verse 2. For in a severe test of affliction, their abundance of joy and their extreme poverty have overflowed in a wealth of generosity on their part. Did you get that? Severe test of affliction. It seems like these churches that experienced persecution from the very off were, were still experiencing it. Severe affliction, extreme Poverty, and yet despite those things, there's this wealth of generosity. What could possibly account for that? What explains for affliction and poverty, yet overflowing with generosity? Well, it's God's grace. Verse 1. We want you to know, brothers, about the grace of God that has been given among the churches of Macedonia. Financial generosity is a grace from God. It is a gift from God. It is not natural. You look at a church who are experiencing affliction, who have extreme poverty, and yet they're giving generously. That is not a natural thing. This is grace. God's at work. The Macedonian church had received grace. Grace had been poured into them, saving grace. 
We get that other little clue of that in verse 2, because it was that combination of, yes, their extreme poverty, but also their abundance of joy. Their abundance of joy having experienced salvation, that joy of their relationship with God, that, that and their poverty overflowed in generosity. They'd experienced saving grace. They'd experienced changing grace. As they grew in their maturity, they grew in their generosity. And so, so gracious was God's work in them that they were enabled to give generously. See, grace was poured into them, and as grace was poured into them, it then flowed out of them. Have a look at verse 3. For they gave according to their means, as I can testify, and beyond their means, of their own accord, begging us earnestly for the favour of taking part in the relief of the saints. The word translated there as favour is the same word grace. That they, they um, begged earnestly for the grace of taking part, which makes sense why in verse 6 and verse 7 we can see generous giving is described as an act of grace. Grace pours in, grace flows out. And what grace it was. So such this, this grace was that they gave according to their means. This was a wonderful picture. This poor church, they might not have actually given much money. The, the total, the amount, might not have been that significant. But it was according to their means. It was generous. It was sacrificial. In fact, it says they gave beyond their means. You see, unlike the Corinthians who needed to be reminded to give, they pleaded to give. They were so eager to give, and yet they had so little to do so. And, and they were so eager, and, and they were so, had so little that it seemed like Paul had to be persuaded to take their money to give. You see, they pleaded with Paul to be able to do this. I don't know if you have ever given money to those uh, people outside the tube or the people who come to your, to your door, but so often our motivations by that is really you know, to get them off our back or to do our duty or to, uh, because we feel guilty. But no, not these, not these Macedonians. They desired to do it. They begged to do it. Because their giving was an extension of their hearts. Verse 5. And this not as we expected, but they gave themselves first to the Lord. And then by the will of God to us. They'd so been captured by grace that they'd given them, themselves everything that they were, everything they had to Jesus. <laughs> and recognizing Paul to be an apostle... Of Jesus, they gave himself to Paul and said, look, we're at your service. They gave their hearts, they gave their lives, and therefore they gave their resources, they gave their money. See, this example of the Macedonians shows what happens when grace pours into people. When grace pours in, well, then grace flows out. It shows us, their example shows us that Generous giving is not a burden that is imposed or to be imposed. Generous giving is not because an apostle, let alone a pastor, tells you you should do it. No, it's a joy. It's a, it's a flowing out of the giving of heart. It's a, the privilege of voluntarily sharing in ministry. And it shows us that anyone can do it. Even that poorest of churches there can give generously. I think that takes a mind sh shift for us, because when we think of generous, we probably think of a large amount. That is not what generous is, not in and of itself. It is all relative. It is generous to what they had. It is not about the amount, first and foremost. So Paul holds up the example of the Macedonians well, and then the, what he's doing there was, well, how do the Corinthians compare? Now, in one sense, all right, at the start, they had that same desire. They really wanted to, to do this as well. And yet they have been reluctant to get around it, to, to get around to it. They've been needed to be reminded. 
At present, the far, far wealthier Corinthians were giving far less sacrificially. And so the Macedonians were meant to inspire the the church in Corinth to to go and and do likewise. But that said, it was there to inspire, but also their, their example highlighted what had brought their sacrificial giving about. You see, what had led to that, what the Corinthians needed was a deeper grasp of grace. Because it was as the Macedonians experienced that grace, they, they then, um, they then get that grace poured out. And, and so the Corinthians, most of all, needed a deeper appreciation of grace. They needed to have another look at the sacrificial giving, not just of the Macedonians, but of Jesus. This is our second point, the example of Jesus. You see, Jesus, not the Macedonians, is the supreme example of costly, generous giving. So Paul, he, he briefly encourages the Corinthians to get on and do likewise in verse 6 and 7. We'll come back at later. But having done that, he, he then explains that generous giving, again, is an expression of love. Verse 8. I say this not as a command, but to prove by the earnestness of others that your love also is genuine. You see, this test of giving isn't just about handing over some money. It is a test of their love. He wants to test the sincerity of their love for God, for his people. See, real, genuine love isn't just sentimental feelings or words, but it overflows in action. Giving is an expression of love. And we know that because Jesus best exemplified it. Verse 9. For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor, so that you by his poverty might become rich. Paul says to the Corinthians, he says to us, consider the grace, consider that undeserved sacrificial generosity of the Lord Jesus to every single one of his people. Consider it. Think about it. He was rich, fabulously wealthy in terms of his glorious comforts in heaven from all eternity past. And though he was rich, yet for your sake, for your salvation, he became poor. Not a comment on his family finances, but he left his place of glory and wealth and richness in heaven and came down to earth as a man. He lived, yes, that life of simplicity and much hardship. But his poverty was far again more than that. No, he was arrested. He was unjust, unjustly tried. He was tortured. He was mocked. He was crucified in that most humiliating and painful of ways. But far more than even that, yes, he was stripped of everything he had, but he was even stripped of his relationship with his father. On the cross, as he was forsaken by his father. That was the price of our salvation. And why? Why did he become poor? Well, that, so that we may become rich. And just as Jesus' poverty wasn't a, um, a statement on finances, well, this wealth, this riches that he gives, likewise is not a statement on money. But by his poverty, we might become rich, enjoying his wonderful blessings. That we may enjoy, indeed, much of those blessings that he enjoyed. Enjoying that forgiveness, that um, uh, cleanse conscience, the relationship with God, again, that we can enjoy now, and then heaven and the new creation in perfect relationship with God for all eternity. He became poor that we might become rich. And that is love. That is grace. That's what Paul says, that you Corinthians, yes, look at the example of the Macedonians and see how they've been affected by this grace. And that is how you can be affected by that grace too. And that is how we today, Lionsdown Church, can be affected as well. As we have that deeper grasp of Jesus' grace. 
So we have, Paul holds up the example of the Macedonians and to inspire them and to kind of see, well, how, how are you doing compared to them? He holds up the example of Jesus and then mixed throughout is that encouragement to finish what they'd wanted to do in the first place. So verse 6. Accordingly, as we urged Titus that he had started, so he should complete among you this act of grace. Finish it. Do it. Titus, we'll, we'll see a bit more next week about how the, the practicality is working, but encouraging Titus as he went to the, the church in Corinth, come on, complete it, finish it. Verse 7, he goes on, but as you excel in everything, in faith, in speech, in knowledge, in all earnestness, and in our love for you, see that you excel in this act of grace also. The Corinthians, you know, they were a flourishing, thriving church. They had all kinds of problems that come out very clearly in 1 Corinthians. But by 2 Corinthians, those differences between them and Paul seem to have been reconciled. And in many ways, they were doing really, really well. Paul lists some of them in verse 7. Yes, you may excel in those things, but make sure that you excel in this also. And that word excel is, again, the, from that word from overflow that came back in verse 2. And I think Paul's trying to link that back. Remember the Macedonians, they overflowed with joy. Well, Corinthians, you excel, overflow in your giving. Yeah, they received top marks in some things, but not in giving. So carry on, finish, do it. Again, verse 8 that we looked at already, I say this not as a command, but to prove by the earnestness of others that your love also is genuine. Paul saying to him, look, you love God. You, you, you love each other. You, you love your brothers and sisters across the world. Give. Does, does, your, does your, your bank statement show that? Prove it. And then he goes on further. Uh, in verse 10, once again, go and um, finish it. Verse 11, so now finish doing it as well so that the readiness in desiring it may be matched by your completion of it. But in verse 12, here is such an important point for us. For if the readiness is there, it is acceptable according to what a person has, not according to what he does not have. It seems possible that the Corinthians... Part of the reason that held them up was the fact that I don't feel like they didn't feel like they could give enough. I mean, it wasn't a kind of significant enough. But Paul's saying that that's not what generous giving is about. It's not about the amount, and the Macedonians have proved that. No, it's the, the, the heart attitudes. That's what's really important. The readiness is there, well, it is acceptable by God. And again, that's so wonderful. This money, although it was going to God's people over there, yet first and foremost, it was given to God. It was acceptable to him according to what they had, not what they didn't have. And then he goes on in verse 13 and 14 uh, and 15. Again, perhaps another reason was, oh, it's a bit unfair, isn't it? We, we're giving them now. Are we going to kind of be made destitute in order to co cover them. Well, no, that's not what Paul's talking about. Verse 13. For I do not mean that others should be eased and you burdened, but that as a matter of fairness. Your, your abundance at the present time should supply their need so that their abundance may supply your need, that there may be fairness. He's saying, look, yeah, at the moment, Corinthians, you are really wealthy. You're, you're, you're thriving, flourishing. Who knows, maybe in the past, the Macedonians will be, do, um, the church in Judea will, will um, be the same. And you might be in need. And well, you give to them, your brothers and sisters, and there may be a time when they give it back to you. You never know. And then that final wonderful conf um, confirmation that generous sacrificial giving, God loves it and honors it. Verse 15 As it is written, whoever gathered much had nothing left over. And whoever gathered little had no lack. Pointing back to the Exodus and to God's miraculous provision of the manna in, um, uh, in the wilderness. And all of God's people had exactly 
what they needed. So having seen these two examples, Macedonians, most even better Jesus, see it through, finish it off, get on with it. How about us? How about us? Well, I think perhaps in this room there may be, I don't know, four or five um, different groups of people. Firstly, I want to say, uh, for those of you, if you're not yet a Christian, you're here because maybe you've come with a friend or a family member, or maybe you're exploring the Christian faith and you're thinking about it. I do want to say really clearly, we do not want your money. We do not want your money. Not yet, anyway. (laughs) Give yourself to God first. Give yourself to God first. Understand this gift. Christianity is a gift. It is not something that can be bought or earned or won. It is a gift from the Lord Jesus Christ. Understand that first and foremost. But maybe you are a Christian. Uh, You are a Christian. Maybe you're a young Christian. And this is just something you've never really thought about. As I said, as a church, we haven't looked at it for five years. It may be something that has just been nowhere on your radar. Well, this little series, I hope and pray, will be an encouragement to you to think about what Christian giving is. What should I give to? How much should I give? Those practical things, when we will get more practical... Uh, hopefully this will be a time for you to, to take some of these principles away and go, okay, what do these principles look like in my life and in our life as a church? There'll be people also in the church you know, who, who do give regularly. You know, the standing order goes out monthly by month, month by month. But perhaps that heart attitude feels a bit more like it's a burden than a privilege. You know, I do it because it's something I know I should do but I try not to think about it very much. And it just goes off and I don't notice it. But again, I hope and pray that this series is going to be a helpful reminder for us that it is a privilege and a joy. That it is something that flows from a heart that is captured by grace, that has grace poured in, and so loves to pour grace out. And then there'll be people in here who are and have for many years given hugely sacrificially, very generously to gospel work, I hope and pray this series is going to be a real encouragement for us, for you, that that is going to be, uh, that you're doing the right thing, that it is a good thing, and to give you new and fresh joy in it. As I say, I'm, we're going to get to more kind of practical outworkings in the following weeks. And, I, and in one sense, I, my application today, I didn't really want to say go and really do anything particular just yet. The one thing I would just encourage us all to do, particularly because we have had this in the building project, is perhaps in the building project we had those appeals and we're like, yeah, that's so exciting. I'm really excited to go and give for um, this gospel place in 1990 Spinet Road. It's great. I'd I'd love to do it. And it just hasn't happened yet. Or maybe this is a reminder to, again, think about those commitments you made either on a bit of paper or in your heart and say, okay, yeah, I, I do need to follow those things through. But really for now, I just want to highlight the principles that we've seen. The principles for us, that giving is an overflow of a heart that has received grace. A voluntary thing, a delight to serve God and his people and his God's work. I want to highlight the fact that it is that every single Christian can do it because it's not about how much money we have or don't have. The giving of £10 for one person may be extremely costly and really sacrificial and really generous. The giving of £10,000 for another may not be generous or costly or sacrificial. It's all about the amounts. It's all about according to what we do have, not what we don't have. And so one of the things, there are are two numbers um, that I asked John, our treasurer, about One is the total amount of money we have. But the other one is the amount of people who give. And I'm equally interested in that number. And as a church, what do we excel in? And I think, in God's grace, the church has been hugely generous and sacrificial for many, many years. But actually, that total number of people of giving isn't perhaps as big as we might expect. 
I should have got a number from you, John. Can you remember what it is? Is that 60 units, isn't it? 62 units or families. or couple, So if there's a couple, maybe it only comes from one bank balance, but we're, we're counting that as one, one, isn't it? So we probably have hundreds and about 100 units or something in the church, and we have about 60 units giving. And there are many good reasons why people may not give. But one of the things I want to draw out is that giving, we give according to our means. And so for one person to give five pounds a month, that may be generous and sacrificial. And it's that other number, that how many people are giving, that I'm equally interested in. And that I'm praying by, God, by God's grace, he would work in us and stir that up towards generosity. This has, in one sense, been a very long introduction. A very long introduction to the series. We're going to have two more weeks thinking about this, and we will get practical, and we are going to see enormous things, but again, we are going to be reminded again and again and again that generous giving comes as grace flows in, pours in, grace then flows out. And so what I want us all to do most of all is to go away remembering the Lord Jesus Christ, who though he was rich, yet for our sake he became poor, so that through his poverty we might become rich. Let's pray to him now. Our Lord Jesus, we thank and praise you for your grace, for your sacrifice, for your love, that though enjoying the full comforts and blessings and rights and privileges in heaven, yet for our sake you became poor. We praise you that through your poverty, through your, your death, most of all, you shower your blessings upon us, your people. Please would we receive and grasp and grab hold of and deepen our appreciation of that grace. And please would you show us all individually and as a church what that grace flowing out of us should look like over these weeks. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.